frequently in spoken and written word, contrasts are placed before us in order to amplify or make obvious difference. It's good or bad. Unfortunately, the rep repetition of such contrasts often hardens our thinking, and we fall into hard binaries of thinking that the only choice is between two things, good or bad. I have a close friend who has been known for quite a while, went through a um, phase, I guess you could say, of asking me, Whitney, is this bad? And I said, I don't even know how to answer that question. Finally, through conversation, we got to the place where he himself recognized the absurdity of such a simple ask. There's more to it than is it bad. I think about other areas in our life where we fall into binaries in an effort to make some clear difference. When I think about algorithms, you know they're all ones and zeros. There's nothing else in there but ones and zeros. <laughs> We make lists for decisions of pros and cons, right? When I see parents of two children, I say, caution. It can be tempting to put them in stark contrast to one another. Oh, he's the loud one, she's the soft one. Oh, she's the busy one, he's the lazy one. Oh, he's the funny one, she's the serious one. There's lots of variation within each of us. And in fact, I think that's where we bristle the most, is when people want to reduce us to a simple word or phrase, and we say, hold up, hold up, hold up. I'm not that. There's more to me than what that word explains. And this is what Jesus takes to task in our gospel today. Jesus uses or affirms that when people call him the Messiah, they are considering him rightly. And then he goes on to tell them what that means. He goes on to define, if you will, what the word Messiah means. And you hear Peter's reaction. Perhaps he said out loud what everyone was thinking. Peter reduces Jesus to the image of Messiah as he had been raised to believe. And Jesus won't have it. The Messiah is the one who saves. That's what the word actually means. And we, I think, also have diminished Jesus the Christ into something very particular. Maybe we think of the Messiah as the one who saves when I'm dead. Or maybe we think of the Messiah as the one who will save me when I finally, I don't know, clean up my act, or make myself worthy, or repair a broken relationship. It's difficult, perhaps, for us to consider what does it mean to be saved in the middle of the mess? What does it mean to be saved when we are conscious of our unworthiness? What does it mean to be saved in the midst of broken relationships? I invite you to think about it for a minute. I'll leave you a second of silence. What is it that you feel or think or believe is too complicated or too scary to something for the one who saves. The Jews anticipated the Messiah in Jesus' time. They were waiting for the Messiah. And they had very specific understanding of what the Messiah would do and how the Messiah would act, what the Messiah would be like. I think about it similarly to how people now talk about Jesus coming again, and we hear, heard reference to it in our scriptures um, for the daily office this morning, in the book of Revelation, when it articulates this is what will happen, first this, then that. But we must remember that Jesus has been the Savior of the world for all time, even before any of us were conscious of it. The Messiah comes to us as the Word made flesh. That's what Jesus is. I'm reminded in John's first, on the first chapter of John's Gospel, right at the start, when it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of the people 
The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. In Jesus, we see God's word become flesh, and that is life-changing, world-altering. When we hear about the stories of the healings, as we've been hearing in these last few weeks from the Gospel of Mark, people are astounded that Jesus heals with a word. He says to people, your sins are forgiven, take up your mat and walk. Who does that? It's his word that creates the healing. His word becomes action. The word of God becomes action in Jesus. Now, as you have maybe been conscious over these last few weeks, James has been, we've been reading from the epistle of James, and so far he's been reminding us about the significance of actions, that a faith without works is dead. And yet words really do matter. He turns his writing attention toward the power of the tongue, and to speak is to act. A huge fire can be set ablaze by the word. Two weeks ago, when we read from the epistle of James, we read these words, If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Hmm. I think we instinctively know this. When people's words and actions don't match, we, we can't take them seriously. We can't make sense of them. In essence, we say to whoever it is, I don't know what you believe. Your words say this and your actions say that, and I just really don't know what it is. I know that I'm not telling you anything new when I bring this up. You've known this since you were like three, maybe four. (laughs) This is why people avoid a religion, I think, as well. They don't want to look like hypocrites. They know that they can't fool themselves into thinking that they are righteous, and so they just avoid it altogether. But here's the paradoxical truth about following Jesus. When we start to bring forth our areas of confusion and mess and we allow God to save them, life becomes more congruent. Life becomes more in harmony and agreement. We have a peace which passes understanding. Why? Because the peace isn't contingent on everything being right or perfect. It's not contingent on the circumstances being set up as we had outlined them, our own agenda. Peter and others had their own agenda as to how the Messiah should be. We begin to, to discover when we bring forth all these areas into the saving work of God in Christ, we begin to discover that the peace is in Christ's saving power, making a way where there was no way. And so even in the midst of it all, we know that we are being held in salvation. Our invitation as followers of Jesus is to find meaning in in Jesus' definition of the Messiah, in Jesus' definition as the one who saves. And in order to do this, we have to listen. We have to listen to those areas where we get defensive, particularly because it's where we are hurt or where we feel shame or fear. When we listen to our defensiveness, we can recognize the truth that this needs to be saved. Something needs to change here because I can't protect myself from what I feel at this moment. If I could interpret Jesus' words, I would say that he said to the disciples, loosen your certitude and ask the question, what would love have me do? What would love have me do? I remember when I was first given that question, when my spiritual director said to me, Whitney, just ask, what would love have me do? I don't remember the circumstances. It was more than 15 years ago for sure. But I remember my feeling to this invitation. Whitney, just ask the question, what would love have me do? I remember the feeling. It was like a heaviness, a heavy mass in my gut. It was immovable and resolved. It was certainly there. I remember having the feeling that I didn't want to be that open to love's changing power. I didn't want to. I knew what I wanted, and I knew how I wanted to get there. And this is what we hear Peter say 
what he gives voice to in today's gospel. He is so certain of how the Messiah should act that he has, and perhaps his defensiveness is born of hurt or shame or fear. He is so certain, and Jesus has to meet that self-centered power with his words. Get behind me, Satan. You are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And that is the truth. We see that throughout the Gospels, and we will read it in the coming weeks about how people understand and interpret Jesus' messiahship on human terms. We can only see what we can see and plan accordingly. We do not see the whole picture. We do not see the future in its indefiniteness. But God sees beyond our binaries, beyond good and bad, so we can't really answer the question with a yes or no when someone says, is this good or bad? We can just say, I don't know. But the question is, what difference does it make to our plan whether we determine if it's good or bad? If our answer is, what would love have me do? You see, we become free from having to organize all the things and determine its value if we simply respond to the question, what would love have me do? What would love have me do in the midst of this mess? What would love have me do in the midst of my confusion? What would love have me do in the midst of my fear or shame or hurt? To be sure, the answer will come in tangible ways. It will come in a word or action which calls us to lay down our lives, that being our own agenda, and to get to the good place we desperately want to go, salvation. We want to be saved. And as we let love lead us, our ears will become tuned to Jesus' voice and we will know how to follow. But it must start with listening. Now, as a note of encouragement, I want to let you know that a good rule of thumb is to check in with trusted Christian friends after you listen. People whose ears are also turned, tuned to Jesus' voice. Am I hearing this right? We might ask. Love seems to be asking me to do this. How does it sound to you? And I want to encourage you to take all the time that you need to listen in your conversation with friends and as you return to that quiet space in between your confusion and your longing. Take time to listen, because each action makes a way for the next one. The Epistle of James reminds us that everyone makes mistakes, so we do not need to think that perfection is required. Only faithfulness. As the great spiritual teacher Thomas Merton said, with God, a little sincerity goes a long way. And so we return to our sincerity of heart. And I have to say, looking out at this congregation, knowing each of you, I have confidence that each of you want your actions to direct you in the way of love. And so let us conclude with a prayer by Thomas Merton that allows us to move in the space of love even in the midst of our uncertainty. Let us pray. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think that I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope that I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore will I trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>